Kirana Tata Katoto, Mai e te Tipua, Mai e te Tahito, Mai e te Kahui Ona Arike, Tihe Moriora, Norara Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Kato. Welcome everyone. Um, uh, it's a privilege to be here. Um, we have released our financial stability report for November 2020. Um, we do this twice a year. Um, I am, as per usual, surrounded here by uh, infinite wisdom from my colleagues at Te Puti Matua, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, uh, and um, some of this wisdom is also in the front row here, um, and it will be used uh, to assist the government um, as per a letter we received yesterday, which I'm sure we will get to talk about. Um, before that, I do want to say it is with great pride that I can outline the resilience of the New Zealand economy and its financial system in the face of the COVID-19 economic shock. The ongoing containment of COVID-19 and the significant fiscal and monetary policy support has ensured that the New Zealand economy has performed as well as is possible over recent months. Economic activity contracted severely in the June quarter of this year, and it still remains below the pre-COVID-19 levels of activity. But that significant fiscal and monetary policy support has acted to limit the extent of the shock to both households and businesses. Uh, we've used our monetary and financial tools in unison, um, given that we are a full service uh, central bank, to help achieve these robust outcomes. The necessary low interest rates have supported the economy, uh, in part by lowering barriers to invest, to the hurdle rate for investment, improving cash flows in households and businesses, and of course ensuring that the New Zealand dollar exchange rate remains uh, competitive. The stimulus will continue, um, so as to support the economic recovery and ensure uh, to best ensure that the bank achieves its remit, which is low and stable consumer price inflation, while also, of course, contributing to maximum sustainable employment. Uh, over recent months, uh, it has been very pleasing to see that the business sector has also been innovative, um, the, particularly through the adoption of technology and many flexible uh, working uh, regimes and operating practices. Business failures, uh, non-performing bank loans and unemployment have all been much lower than expected at the outset of this COVID-19 economic shock to date. Uh, this relatively positive economic outturn uh, means that the New Zealand financial system has not been tested as severely as it could have been. The banking system has maintained strong buffers of capital and liquidity, and the insurance sector remains well capitalised. So while it's very pleasing to be outlining this relatively positive economic news so far, I do want to caution about the economic challenges that remain ahead. COVID-19 remains rampant internationally. Uh, this poses significant ongoing risks to New Zealanders' health, and economic prosperity. International economic activity is being severely constrained. Uncertainty remains elevated and debilitating. And international border restrictions of various forms will continue for a long time to come. Here in New Zealand, businesses will also face ongoing challenges as fiscal support measures unwind. Uh, this will lead to increased loan impairments for banks. Uh, some comforting news is that our stress test conducted earlier this year on the financial system shows that our banks can withstand a significant rise in general, general unemployment before their credit provision would be questioned and or curtailed. Finally, I acknowledge the actions to meet our inflation and employment remit, namely low interest rates, have spurred activity in the housing market. While consumer price inflation remains at the low end of our target range and unemployment remains above what we would consider the maximum level of sustainable employment, house prices have risen considerably. Rising household wealth and its feed through into consumer and investor confidence is an important channel for monetary policy to be effective. However, it is only one channel. 
as I've already mentioned, a lower than otherwise New Zealand dollar exchange rate, reduced financial barriers to invest and improved business and household cash flows are the other channels at work for monetary policy. All of these channels have ensured that monetary policy remains effective. In terms of financial stability, we have observed an increase in higher risk mortgage lending, particularly by property investors, not owner occupiers, but investors. High risk loans increase financial vulnerability to households, businesses and banks. Uh, for example, high leverage uh, in the housing sector poses a risk should house prices decline or unemployment rises. And we have been talking about this now for a long period of time. To manage this risk, we have announced our intentions to reimpose the loan to value ratios, uh, restrictions to guard against continued growth in higher risk lending. And to do so, uh, we're doing so to ensure that banks remain resilient to any future housing market downturn. Uh, we also intend to work with government in a, uh, in a rapid, constructive, open manner uh, on assessing longer term solutions to housing affordability. Um, and this is as requested in the letter received from the Minister of Finance yesterday. The Minister's letter acknowledges the Reserve Bank's goals around inflation and employment remain as they are, and that monetary policy decisions remain those of the Monetary Policy Committee at Tipu Te Matua. Uh, in our holding response, uh, which we will um, add to later once we've had time to consider it, I do want to say I'm very pleased and proud of the fact that we've been asked to assist because we sit here with one of the largest repositories of macroeconomic expertise in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, uh, we will be assisting as we go through, but I've already highlighted that we do take housing costs um, into consideration when both measuring consumer price inflation and setting monetary policy conditions. Likewise, we consider economic and financial risks from asset prices when setting our financial regulatory policy. So we look forward to working with government on the long-term and very complex issue of supply and affordability of houses in Aotearoa. I'm pleased to note that the recent data shows first home buyers are at a record share of the housing market at present a record share, making up 25% of house purchases in the recent September quarter. New home building consents are also at elevated levels on the supply side and at a record level in the Auckland region at present, a record since 1990. But there's always more that can and should be done when it comes to affordability and we will provide our insights accordingly and work with government with pace and integrity. Meitaki Mayata, thank you very much. We're now open to questions. Um, uh, Matthew Brockett from Bloomberg. Governor, would adding house prices to your remit compromise your ability to meet your employment mandate? Uh, we have to sit and assess that. We received the letter yesterday and we have not had a monetary policy committee discussion about that, but as you, as I've outlined both in the letter and just then, we consider asset prices and housing costs already in our monetary policy statement. Uh, our remit remains the same and, uh, and our decisions are as per the monetary policy statement two weeks ago. Do you have any concerns about the central bank's independence in light of yesterday's developments? No, I don't. Um, it's been made very clear from the letter and from discussions that there is no intention to alter the independence of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. I mean, at one side, it also gives me confidence the fact that we are prepared to have these conversations in an open environment. That itself shows comfort and confidence in the operational capability of the Reserve Bank. Just finally, I wondered um, whether the, the letter yesterday was a surprise to you or whether that you'd had that conversation with the Minister previously. In other words, was it we was blindsided a little bit by that yesterday? I think we would be absolutely remiss to have been surprised by a letter like that. Um, the housing market, house prices, um, the haves, the have-nots, all of these issues have been very high profile for decades in New Zealand. Um, the fact that it's come more recently 
um, is a, a sign that um, nervousness around are we going to be back to where they are. So it's 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 uh, the government's policy. So I have no surprise that we've received a letter. I'm very, I will repeat. I'm really pleased that we are uh, being invited into the discussion. Uh, Thomas Coughlin from Staff. Um, can I ask that if, if Grant Robertson's suggestion had been made uh, earlier, say at the beginning of the year, would that have substantially altered um, or altered in any way the decisions that you've made throughout the year? Um, and and if it would have led to a, a, a substantial difference in your monetary policy, would that mean that fiscal policy would have to pick up more of the, the slack and you'd have to have a much more um, accommodating fiscal policy? Um, I, I'll talk in a hypothetical um, sides there, uh, if there is more demand management needed and less is done by one agency, then more is needed by the other agency. So that's the monetary and fiscal policy working hand in hand. On the uh, what have we done things different, uh, for example, uh, in the previous, I repeat again, our objectives remain the same, which is to maintain low and stable inflation and contribute to maximum sustainable employment. Nothing has changed. Um, have you considered Sorry, sorry I'm just, just for our viewers. Oh, sorry, Jenny Ruth from Business Desk. Um, have you considered um, putting rules around the funding for lending program to either discourage housing lending or to encourage lending to business? Um, yeah, very good question. Thank you, Jenny. And um, yes, we did consider um, whether uh, we have some types of constraints or directions on those, and we agreed that that would reduce the effectiveness of a funding for lending program um, for the purposes that we are introducing it, which is for monetary policy purposes. And so, in a sense, it is our job to ensure that banks have access to funding at the type of interest rate we think is necessary for the country. Um, it is banks' roles to then decide how best to allocate their capital um, when they are managing their books. The more constraints you put on things at our level, uh, the less effective that uh, instruments can be towards that purpose. Uh, Janae Tibshirani from interest.co.nz. Is the Reserve Bank uh, going to ask the Finance Minister to give it uh, to add debt to income ratios to its macro prudential toolkit? Uh, we, we have to consider our prudential toolkit. Um, the Reserve Bank has a history of, of asking for those. Um, we were turned down last time the Governor asked for them uh, with previous governments. Um, so that is another instrument we could use in our macro prudential tool set for um, heading off higher risk lending. Um, so, um, Jeff, I think that answers the question. So we're still sympathetic to it for um, as part of our, our toolkit, and we'll uh, look at that uh, as a part of the uh, discussions and, and options we have next year. At what point do those um, high debt to income levels become concerning to the bank? Uh, as, as you'll see in our financial stability report, um, we talk a lot about the two levels. One, both the level of debt, the other one is the ability to service that debt. So the debt to income ratios remain reasonably stable. Chris? Um, well, debt, debt to income is rising, but debt rising. servicing, as, as at, the Governor is saying, has, has obviously at quite low levels because interest rates are so low. So, you know, you do need to look at both uh, measures, as the Governor is indicating, and, and uh, assess that. I mean, historically, um, what were satisfactory uh, debt-to-income levels we, we used to regard as sort of below six, really. Um, but, of course, you know, low interest rates, if you think they're going to be there for a long time, uh, which is what we're indicating, uh, then you can, you can substantiate sustain a, a, a higher debt-to-income level. So, you know, it, it's a bit context-specific. And I would like to just overlay, coming back to our, our core purpose, that it doesn't matter what the interest rate level is or what the debt-to-income ratio is, if you do not have a job or are unemployed, then you face those challenges of meeting any level of debt or interest rate. Hi, it's Praveen Menon from Reuters. Uh, just on the LVR uh, that you intend to bring in the next year, so I just want to know what you think the impact of that will be. I mean, how how much impact that would have on the housing market, and what do you see uh, going forward in terms of uh, how it plays out? 
Um, I would say that we've got a reasonably good insight um, from that because um, we're, we're uh, um, consulting on the basis of putting them back where they were. So we have observed um, that they do constrain uh, lending behaviour as designed by banks um, around what their portfolio looks like and we were very pleased how effective they were at reducing, I would say, the higher risk end of, of bank lending portfolios. But they're slow moving, they're about new lending, you know, the vast bulk of lending is what's already out there so they don't um, bite overnight um, and also a lot of lending has largely been within the LVRs. I would also note um, that banks have, um, by the vast bulk, certainly by lending, have already moved to where we are negotiating, uh, where we are consulting on with the banks. So, um, so you can kind of look out the window and observe um, what it's doing. Hello, uh, Jane Patterson, RNZ. You've said that your, the committee already considers house prices and its considerations. So if Grant Robertson's inclusion was ad adopted, what actual difference would that then make to the way that you, the committee makes those considerations? Um, I, I can't speak on behalf of the whole committee. That's the nature of a committee, and the committee hasn't met yet to... to um, to opine on what that does and to work with, um, to understand where that fits within what the, broad, the government's broader um, uh, work um, objectives. But if you're making the point that you're already considering house prices, would you consider an inclusion redundant? I just wanted to make sure that people understand where we are starting from, have clear expectations around what can and can't be done. Um, because uh, setting up false expectations for broad stakeholders, public alike, is is not good policy setting. Um, any comments? I'll add to that. I mean, the, the letter really inviting us to provide uh, uh, our views, our expertise into this uh, really important conversation about what can be done about housing affordability. So I think that that's the time we need to, to take to to contribute to that, and and uh, it's it's broader than one specific. Uh, suggestion that was made in the letter, that's it's, it's what uh, could possibly be done and, and how might we best help. I'm Brian Taylor Herald. Um, I don't think it's unprecedented for the bank to offer the government some advice on tax policy. Um, might that form part of your advice this time? Yes, for, for us uh, at the moment I don't know the, the broader work agenda. Um, so one would assume that um, issues of taxation would be in the broader work agenda. Um, so we will see what comes. Um, there has been so much work over 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 decades on this issue that I don't think problem identification is too difficult. It's really around um, appetites for um, for well, what are the objective functions of the work and appetites for accepting um, policy recommendations. Jenny Ruth from Business Desk again. Um, it's obvious that housing loans are much easier for the banks to make. They need less capital. Um, so uh, it's a natural area for lending to go. And ANZ has already got 67% of its balance sheet in housing loans. Wouldn't it be reasonable to expect that absent any kind of restrictions or incentives to do otherwise, that the banks, the bulk of the lending that banks will do using the FLP will be on housing loans? Uh, it depends where the demand is coming from. Um, so I so, uh, totally agree with the stats and the observations. The, the challenge, of course, is where is the demand for lending come? We can provide access to capital we can't force banks to lend and we can't for force businesses or households to borrow. That is not our job. Um, so should business investment pick up, then I imagine bus demand for business loans will pick up. That is in, in the hands of those out there in the economy of Aotearoa. Hi, Jenna Lynch, News Hub. Um, I just wonder whether you could expand a little on the comment you made before. What false expectations do you believe the Minister has created with that letter? Uh, no, you paraphrased me. I didn't say the Minister created false expectations. I said I don't want to create false expectations around what can be achieved. 
I want to have clear facts on the table and move forward with clear actions um, because there is a lot of very serious thinking and a lot of very serious work ahead of policymakers, business sector and government um, on this really important issue of access to affordable housing. What are the dangers of false expectations of the public when it comes to the housing market? Uh, that the wrong things get done and important things don't get done. Such as? Uh, I, I could go on for weeks on that one. I think you, you understand what I'm saying that we don't prove successful in making housing affordable and available to the people of New Zealand for current and all future generations. The, could I ask for your initial reaction to the specific proposal that was made by the Finance Minister to include stable house prices in a clause of the remit? Is that something that you will can consider doing or would you prefer to address his concerns through other measures? Uh, we will consider um, the proposal um, because we've been asked to consider it and it's absolutely correct that we should um, with uh, the Monetary Policy Committee. Um, sitting in that clause, it's uh, why I choose that part because the Minister made very clear yesterday that the core objective function around inflation and employment does not change. Um, that they are not interested in interfering with Section 8 of the Reserve Bank of the New Zealand Act, which is around that objective function, and hence there are other issues that we may have consideration for when setting policy. So to me it seemed like an obvious place, if you were thinking about doing this, where you would suggest it going. But the letter is very open. It's about broader areas, including both our financial regulatory policy as well as our monetary policy, and of course using the wisdom of um, you know the significant macroeconomic expertise we have in the bank around what other issues might you consider um, you know to get to their objectives. We share the same objectives in part because they gave them to us, which is around economic well-being for New Zealanders. So this is you know, a very valid and important topic for us to be involved in, and we will do the work. If you do um, make some changes in accordance with what the Minister is asking, does that make further monetary easing less likely? Uh, there's two loops there. One, you keep saying, if I do, I don't have any say in it. This is a uh, monetary policy uh, remit, which has a very clear legal process and steps to go through should one want to change it. There are near-term uh, um, efforts where you could use Section 12 of our Reserve Bank Act as an example, um, which would involve an order in council, a signing off by the by the Governor General, and a re-signing by, by the Monetary Policy Committee, myself representing it as Governor of the Reserve Bank. So there are those policies, there's also in the future, should one decide to change it or not. Other than that, um, I stand with what I said, uh, the hypotheticals. We know, um, Christian, uh, since the actions were taken since March, um, regarding to otherwise? Yeah, I mean, if we hadn't taken the actions we had since March, interest rates right across the yield curve would be over 100 basis points higher than they are. The exchange rate would be 5 to 10 per cent higher than it is, and all the economic implications uh, of those those different settings. Um, you know, stepping away from the details of the the, the letter and, and the discussion around that, stepping back and thinking well, what is going to drive interest rates over the medium term in New Zealand, uh, it will be inflation pressures and, and what, what is required um, to d deliver on our dual mandate that, that will stay, still stay in place, that will be the overriding medium term driver. We get that, but I want to have one more stab at it because you'll be aware of the, of the, the impact that the letter had in terms of the expectations for, for RBNZ monetary policy. So I'm just asking again today, are rate cuts or any further monetary easing? Our less policy likely? intentions stand as stated in the monetary policy statement um, uh, two weeks ago, there or thereabouts. Um, we have no change to that. We will next be sitting as a monetary policy committee forward-looking in February, as per usual, with the mandate as is. Mm. And I think that the financial stability report that we're, we're talking about today um, reinforces those messages from the Monetary Policy Committee, which is there are still a lot of risks out there uh, and there are actions we need to support the resilience of the financial system and um, 
you know, have our eyes up uh, for what monetary policy actions might need to be taken in the future. Um, just coming back to one of the first questions, can you be a bit more specific about the notice that you had about the receipt of the letter and also about whether you were told or in, in what time frame that it would be released publicly? Uh, so, yeah, thank you. I mean, I talked I talked generally, you're correct, around, around um, the issues being there and everywhere and um, we are highly aware of the challenges it imposes on, on the people of this country and policy makers. In terms of the specifics, I was alerted on Monday by the Minister of Finance around the intentions to send the letter. I received the letter yesterday um, uh, by the time it was finished and drafted around Midday. Uh, no, we we were fine. There's, you know, we we can read. It was only a page and a bit long. Mm -hmm. um, any issue about? Oh, sorry, Hamish Rutherford from the New Zealand Herald. Any issue around the particular timing, as in the day before this presentation? Mm -hmm. In some ways, uh, it's actually helpful because uh, you know we had all of our material written here. I think there's been one sentence changed um, in, our, in the speaking notes I just provided, which was a bit at the end saying, yes, we received a letter, yes, we will respond. Uh, I think it's very good to be able to be back out here and talk about where we're at, what we're doing, um, that our objectives remain the same, that our intentions are as they are and to remind people that we have a fantastic working relationship um, with the fiscal authorities and the government. Um, I think they are mutually inclusive in that circle I just drew. But. Uh, Janae Tipsharani from interest.co.nz. To what extent is there a bit of frustration at the Reserve Bank over the, I guess, uh, public concern around house prices and also the finance minister's response and also the response of the opposition? I mean... Um, you know, in, in many ways, the Reserve Bank would argue what it's done has been uh, successful in monetary policy. Are, are you a little bit annoyed? Uh, I won't bring emotions into it. Um, and I do believe, as I put there, I use the word privilege, pride, resilience. Uh, we do believe we've been highly successful in working both with our tools um, in unison, our monetary and financial tools. We've worked very, very closely with government around the fiscal issues and the economy has proved to be be one of the most resilient on planet Earth to date. So those are fantastic outcomes. Uh, I flippantly used a phrase, a first-class problem. If you could ever take sound bites away when you're being uh, interviewed a thousand times over, what I meant was it was the worst problem except for the alternatives. When it comes to an issue we needed to be challenged with today, Nine months ago, when we were standing there having conversations, we all remember talking about scenarios. We all remember talking about incredibly dark places, incredible uncertainty, how do we behave? We are now in a much stronger position, but not out of the woods. And yes, the housing issue, etc., is an issue. It's been an issue forever. Just as, by the way, can I say, is the many other things we deal with, such as financial inclusion, climate change and the responses to that. This document carries through vast bulks of significantly important issues that we are working on. House prices sell newspapers. Uh, Governor Bernard Hickey for Stuff and the Kaka. Uh, the government's talked about wanting to a reset or look at its settings to improve housing affordability. What do you think would look like housing affordability from the bank's point of view? Because in the uh, statement you've talked about house price to income multiples and but I mean how how much should house prices change to be something that's affordable? Yeah that is just a fantastic question. Thank you Bernard and one which I don't have an answer. And hence it's one which we have to think much harder about because if we are asked to target house prices, the obvious question would be, and what would you want? Now, we're not being asked to at all. We're being asked to consider. Also, um, are we talking about uh, quantity, quality, locality, uh, owner occupiers, investors, so on and so forth. It is a very rich question because houses are used both as, I would say, a consumer 
durable that we use and we capture the costs of that in our monetary policy, rents, rates, transaction costs, um, construction costs, but they are also used as a commodity by some people the way in which they invest. And it is only one asset amongst many assets that people have available to them to invest in. In New Zealand, it has been the favoured asset. And our, the rest of our capital markets remain too thin, too small. And I would love to see those grow and deepen because that in itself may create a much richer and more sustainable um, financial system. How, how concerned would the bank be if the government um, was to be successful in uh, making housing more affordable, which triggered or saw house prices fall a significant amount. Would that um, be something you'd be concerned about? Uh, we would certainly be concerned about financial vulnerability and we talk about it very explicitly in our financial stability report that the more concentrated a loan is, the high leveraged a loan is, then the more vulnerable it is to changes in either the price of that asset, in this case we're talking about housing, or the ability to service the debt that you have used to leverage that asset, in this case a mortgage. At the moment, serviceability has gone down because interest rates are low, but we ourselves and the banks that actually do the lending stress test continuously and ask tough questions of households around, show me under those conditions that you are able to continue to service this loan under many darker economic scenarios than the one we're currently in. So I always uh, implore people to think not about just how far can I stretch myself when I am doing this, but more importantly, how can I sustain my activity when I am leveraged? We've talked about rural um, loans in some parts being well overstretched. By the way, we talk about this in this document for those um, um, other listeners um, interested in things other than houses. Uh, we talk about dairy. We talk about commercial property. Uh, we talk about a lot of areas where concentrated loans are causing vulnerabilities. And we are talking about banks using their NAUS, using their risk appetite statements, being sensible, being courageous, having a risk appetite statement they'll be consistent with to head off these types of issues. Otherwise, it's a regulatory impost and we're back being, being um, at the table having to own these things. Oh, I breed with NBR. I mean, a lot of comment around house prices, but I'm wondering how worried are you by rents as well, given that most households renting are paying a huge part of their household income on rent. Yeah. And that's probably driving a lot to think they may as well take on a massive, massive mortgage because, in fact, with low interest rates, it's no more expensive than the rent they're paying. I'll answer the first bit really quickly, then I'm going to pass over to uh, Christian you can, uh, and or Jung around the renting side. But the first thing is a part of lower interest rates does make people think rather than, um, rather than lease or consume through rent, I might buy. So that, that is a, 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 an interesting and important dynamic, and that will happen at any particular level of interest rate, that, that marginal choice. Um, but what you bring up, Brent, is part of that broader challenge that we have with the work ahead of us. Um, if you've got disinterested investors who are dominating a rental market, then have you got the best rental structure available? Uh, our rental structure in New Zealand also means, um, you know, we've talked about countries in, uh, in Europe where you can have very low interest rates and no pressure on house prices because you've got a deep and liquid rental market. Contribution of rental costs and things? Yeah, so the rent makes up uh, about 10% of, of the CPI and has been running at a little bit over 3% uh, on an annual basis. So it hasn't picked up anywhere near as strongly as house price inflation at this point, but it's something that we're, we're, we're monitoring and it, it goes into the overall picture of inflation pressures that we're seeing in terms of setting monetary policy. Cool. Can we just... Would, one more? Yep. Do you yeah. feel that the government is trying to deflect responsibility for the housing market? I think the government has been courageous in writing an open letter to ask for assistance. And I feel proud that that letter has come to us because that allows us to engage in, in a very open way around this important issue. Um, uh, generally what I've found is, as Governor of the Reserve Bank, we must play strictly ballroom, we must stick to mandate, one couldn't possibly comment. So sometimes it's nice to be asked to comment on other issues. 
I bring in that climate change discussion, it was only three years ago when I mentioned that as a possible financial risk that I then received an enormous amount of questioning as to what's that got to do with your role as the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Um, hopefully it's quite clear if and when we are talking about housing why that is the case we have been asked to. One to go. Matthew, make it a bring it home. <laughs> Is a negative OCR still on the table? Uh, we've always said we want to be operationally ready to be able to implement an OCR. Um, it's been everyone else's forecast as to when that may or may not happen. Uh, no, it's the answer is I just said, Matthew, and I think you should engage your brain and think about that because I don't believe we've ever said we are going to be implementing a negative OCR. We've said we want to be operationally ready should we need to. Um, if yeah. conditions warrant it. If conditions warrant it. And so it's um, go and ask the bank forecasters around, around their stories. Just at the end, I just want to acknowledge someone who has been incredibly wise and guided um, New Zealand through safe financial um, soundness um, and efficiency. Um, Mr Chris Bloor sitting there very quietly. Uh, Chris is your... 23rd Financial Stability Report. He's been through GFCs, he's been through European credit crises, he's been through all black losses, yet, yet to be back to back. He will, um, he will move on to other activities, I'm probably guessing housing market activities, um, for, uh, for Tipu Te Matua, but thank you very much, good sir. Uh, Mei Taki Maata, thank you.